God, today we just recognize that there is nothing that you cannot do, God, that any, any miracle that we're asking for, we're trusting not in chariots, we're not trusting in horses, we're not trusting in wealth, we're not trusting in our own strength, but we are trusting in you, that you are a loving God. And if you come through, we're gonna give you all the honor and the glory, and if it feels like you don't come through, we're still gonna stand firm on the truth that you have never let us down, that even when it feels like that you don't show up, that we're trusting you and we're gonna to continue to wait and we're gonna to continue to knock on your door because who else would we trust? Where else would we go other than you? You're the only one we know that can provide. You're the only one you, we know that loves us the way you love us and that can come through the way you can come through. So Father, we just pray today that you would be the God that we, know, that we have known you to be, that we'd know you today in a real personal way. We trust you. We love you, and we thank you for Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Amen. Kind of feels like we ought to just pray and go home after that. Anybody with me? Some of y'all are like, no, that'd be great. I could make it for kickoff if we'd go ahead and wrap it up now. Um, I really appreciate Liz leading us in that song. The thing that I love about the people that lead here is that they lead like they got a story, right? And uh, that's true. My name's Clay, by the way. I'm so uh, honored and glad that um, I get the opportunity to preach today. Um, I honestly, coming up out of that song, it reminded me of growing up. I grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Yeah, that's right. So you, uh, it, it would, it, Sundays in the fall was always so perplexing because sometimes you'd show up to church on Sunday just with a heavy heart because your team lost. And then sometimes you'd show up just feeling like, God, I got something extra. I don't want to say it to you today, just in gratitude. And uh, I live in Atlanta, Georgia now, so it's filled with bulldogs, and I'm so grateful they lost last night, because they're, they're despicable humans and just um, in desperate need of salvation. No, I'm just kidding. Some wonderful, amazing people, but um, last night, that was a wild football game if you watched that, but um, we're not even here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the Texans. The Texans <laughs> play today at noon. Aren't you glad that God made you a Texan and not a Jaguar? I mean, like, think of how much better your life is. You know what I mean? Like, there are people waking up today going, Duval, trying to act like they're excited about that. They're just doing that because they don't have anything else to cheer for. And then here you are today just feeling so grateful that you got to be a Texan. And I see some of you wearing, like, a Cowboys jersey, which is bizarre to me. That is wild. It is crazy. Um, hey, I want to say hello to everybody uh, at, uh, who's watching online today. We're so glad to see you, so glad to be with you. Everybody at the Ramsey Unit, we just want to tell you hello, and we're with you. Thank you. It is an honor for us that you're here with us, so thank you. Um, Missouri City, everybody at West End, everybody uh, here today, really, really great to be together in church. I know some of you, maybe um, your faith is alive, and your faith is real, and you have put your faith in Jesus, and you've been trying to follow him, and then... Others of you are just trying to figure it out. Maybe somebody invited you. I just think that's one of the things that I love about this church. If you, if you missed Chad's sermon from last week, you've got to go and hear it. It's one of the best sermons on money that I have ever heard. And I'm not just saying that it's not preacher talk, but I'm for real about that. And what's so great about it is I love the big line that he said that God does not want something from you, that God wants something for you. That that is true. That we're going to talk about money today, which is always a little bit... Um, Awkward. I'm going to say it up front, and some of you are going to just slowly get up and leave, right? Because nobody, the two areas of our life that we're most sensitive about, the two areas of our life that we're most unwilling to talk to other people about, sexuality and money. It's just wild how that is. But today we're going to look at this parable that Jesus taught, and it's hard to look at a parable that Jesus taught without talking about money, because almost all of the parables, over half of the parables, talk about money in some form or fashion. And so the one we're going to talk about today, it's bizarre. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to Luke 16. We're going to put it up here on the screen, though. But this one's a little odd, because it doesn't just talk about money, but it also talks about the afterlife, which is a tough topic. I mean, that's a really difficult topic. So let me just open up with this right here. Do you believe there's a life after this? I don't answer it out loud. But do you believe there's a life after this life? Jesus is going to talk about it. In fact, the, the, the main point of this story, it is yes about money, but it is also about what happens after this life. And he's going to connect the two. 
And this is why it's it's a really perplexing, really interesting, really challenging parable that Jesus teaches. But I thought, hey, well, if we're here, let's talk about it. Let's get it out in the open. Let's discuss it. Because what he's going to try to connect is the way you use the money that you have in this life matters. But it doesn't matter for you. It's not, it's not like he's just going to say, if you'll use it well, you'll get a bigger mansion in heaven. That's not what he's saying today. No, what he's saying is how you use your money today has the potential to change lives around you. That's big. And I, I love this parable because it's a little bit of a different angle about money, but it's a, it's a parable that I feel like God has used in my life to change the way my wife and I look at money, the way we try to handle our money, the way, certainly the way we um, see money, the way we deal with our money. Here, here's the way this parable starts, Luke 16. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. All right, now, so already we see the characters in this parable. Two big characters. You've got the owner, you've got the dude who's the business owner, and you, then you've got the guy who's the manager, the person who works for the business owner. Two characters. And he says the owner is frustrated because the manager has been accused of wasting his possessions. And so he does that awkward thing that some of you have experienced. I used to hate getting this text. You ever get that text from your boss that says, hey, you mind stopping by my office before you leave? this afternoon and you're like when you say stop by my your office before I leave you mean like leave forever like is this the end you know what I mean like am I getting fired can you just tell me right now what's happened like did I get caught for stealing boxes on my day off like what what's happening here right shout out to Friday some of you got that some of you didn't but he says yeah drop by my office because we got to talk verse 2 he calls him in and he says What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be a manager any longer. In other words, you're fired, right? In other words, he says, I want to hear what the story is because you've been accused of wasting possessions. We don't know if he was doing it on purpose. We don't know if he had made some bad deals. We don't know if he was playing too much Candy Crush on the job. We don't know what he was doing, but he's been accused of wasting possessions. He needs to give an account because he's being fired and he doesn't have much time left. In other words, he's like, hey, you're done, but I need you to get all the accounts in order so that I can get it from you, get all the passwords so that I can hand it off to the next manager. And so this manager is in an uh, interesting position because now he's going, what am I going to do? I don't have a lot of time left, but I do have a little bit of opportunity and a little bit of time remaining. And so the manager says to himself, I love this. You ever have a conversation with yourself? <laughs> it's, the, it's the most common, it's the, the conversation that you have all day long, which is always running, right? Just talking to yourself, you know? And he says to himself, he says, self? What shall I now do? My master is taking away my job. I'm sure the master is like, I'd actually like to have a word from you. Um, I'm not taking away your job. First of all, it's my job. Secondly, I, I, you, you, you lost your job because you didn't do right. He says, my master is taking away my job, which is probably part of the problem. But he says this. I love this. He says, and I'm not strong enough to dig, which, hey, no shade on him for saying that. Have you tried to dig anything lately? I mean, y'all, digging a hole is like one of the most difficult things. My wife was trying to get me to plant some bushes recently, and I was like, oh, no problem, baby, anything for you. I get out there, uh, two scoops in. I'm like, this is exhausting. I don't know. Some of you might have to dig holes for a living, you know, and others of you are thinking about doing harm on somebody, and hopefully how difficult it is to dig a hole is going to keep you from doing that harm. That's that's Some of you needed to hear that truth today. (laughs) No, I'm just playing. He says, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm too ashamed to beg. He's like, it's like a temptation song, you know? He's like, I don't want to have to end up begging and I I definitely don't want to be digging. And so he says, ah, he says, Eureka though. He says, I got an idea. It's like it hits him. I know what I'll do so that, this is important, when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. Look at what he does. He says, I got an idea on how to use the little time I have so that 
I'll earn influence for myself in the next life, in whatever my next endeavor is. And so here's what he does. He calls in each of his master's debtors, and he asked the first one, he said, how much do you owe my master? And this person said, I owe him 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied, to which he asked him, what are you doing with all that oil? Which is a very common question that's happening right now in our culture. And some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. And all I'm gonna tell you is, is sometimes it's just better to not know. But others of you know, and others of you have been asking that same question. And I'm here to let you know today, whatever it was, it's not good. But this man had been using a lot of olive oil as well, and the manager says, well, I got an idea. Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Now, get your mind out of the gutter. Let's lock back in, because we were headed somewhere. God's got something for us today. I don't know if what he's doing is shady. This is what's difficult, is that something's happening here, and we don't know. He gets accused of foreshadow. He gets accused in a little bit of being dishonest, but at the same time, we don't really know. It's tricky because it's, it's odd for Jesus to celebrate somebody who's doing something dishonest, but what I, don't get confused by Jesus is going to celebrate his creativity. He's going to celebrate how clever he is. He's going to celebrate, he uses a word later called shrewd. He's going to celebrate how shrewd this dude is. But he could have also just been going, look, you know how sales works, right? Maybe some of you that are in sales. In sales, you get paid on commission, right? So it could have been that he's going, all right, well, I know I got to pay. I know what I got to pay the owner, but I'm going to cut out my own commission so that I build a relationship, so that I build some favor with this person, right? And maybe, just maybe, that's what's happening here. Maybe he's going, all right, I'm going to take away, I'm not going to make anything off of this. The only thing I'm going to make is I'm going to make a friend. Because this dude who owes all the oil is like, I don't know what I'm going to do now. I can't pay it all. And he's like, I got your back, man. Can you pay 450? He's like, I can do 450. He's like, make it 450. Go get the truck, fill it up, bring it back in, and we'll call it even. And this dude's like, bro, are you kidding me? He's like, no, no, for real, but like, go do it now. He's like, what can I do to repay you? He's like, I'll, I'll get back with you on that. Right? I mean, he's like, I, I, he's like now, now I got somebody that I feel like I got a relationship with, you know, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Like, that we, we, got a, we got a thing going here. This is great. And then he does it again. Jesus, but you got to also remember, Jesus is making this story up, okay? This is, a, this is a mythical story. It's a made-up story. It's a parable. That's what a parable is. Jesus taught in parables. I love the word parable. The word parable means para is alongside of. Balo means to throw. And so what a parable is, is it's a, a real-life story that Jesus would tell, and then alongside it, he throws a truth so that people can get it easier. So they can pick it up easier. They can understand it easier. And so in this one, Jesus is about to throw some significant truth alongside of the story. Second guy comes in. He says, well, what do you owe? He says, I owe a thousand bushels of wheat. Bro's been baking some bread, right? I don't know what else he's doing with it. Maybe he's got a business. Maybe he's got something going on. But he said, well, can you pay the thousand? He's like, no, I can't pay the thousand. Okay, can you pay the 800? I can pay 800. Cool. Take your bill and make it 800. And the guy goes, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? Well, what do I owe you? And he's like, oh, I'll get to that in a little bit, right? And here's what Jesus said. When he's making this story up, he says this. He says, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. He doesn't say he commended him for being dishonest. No, the, the, the language is he uses the term dishonest manager. He commends him for being shrewd. He says, you are one shrewd dude, right? And then he goes on to say this. We don't have time to dig into this, but this is a really important statement. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. He's like, there's something. Excuse me, my voice cracked there. He said, Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got caught up in middle school for just a minute. He says, 
He says, don't forget that there is something that church people can learn from the way people that are not Jesus people from the way they live. He's like, there's something that you can learn, something you can understand, something that you can take from it. I, I don't know what, um, any of you, show, show, real quick show of hands, wherever you are, anybody grow up in church? Bunch of you, yeah, me as well. I grew up in church. And if somebody were to ask me, well, growing up in church, did they ever talk about money? <laughs> did they ever talk about money? All the time, right? And if they were to say, well, what was the main message that they would say about money? God wants it. He wants your money. Like, that's what I would have thought. I would have thought, like, the main message, just if I were to summarize all the sermons, all the times they talked about it, I would have been like, hold your wallet close, because God just wants your money. In fact, some of you think that. Some of you think that God just wants your money. But I'm telling you, the biggest change that's happened to me financially is understanding what Psalm 24 says, where he says, the earth is the Lord's and all that's in it. In other words, it's all God's money, which is complicated and it's tricky because some of you, you value the fact that you've worked really hard and you feel like, no, the money I have is my money because I've worked for it and I've earned it. To which we would say, but where did you get the physical ability to work for it? Where did you get the cognitive ability to work for it? Where did you get the opportunity to work for that money? God. I was talking to um, one of our amazing volunteers earlier this morning, and she said, hey, what are you preaching on today? I said, why are you asking? You know what I mean? I'm like, are you trying to figure out if you're not going to show up or anything? No, she's like, I'm already here. I'm like, cool, cool. Um, I said, I'm preaching on money. And she said, um, oh, she said, I had the funniest thing happen with one of my grandkids. I was trying to teach them about money brought them to church, I gave her some money to put it in the bucket. The bucket passes by and she looks at me and she puts it in her pocket. <laughs> and she said, well, she looked down there and whispered and she says, what are you doing? And she said her granddaughter looked back up at her and goes, God doesn't need my money. <laughs> Which I thought was kind of funny because we both looked at each other and laughed and were like, I mean, she has a point, you know what I mean? Like, God doesn't. It's not like God's up in heaven being like, oh, man, like, I left my wallet, and I wanted to get, like, extra guacamole at Chipotle. Like, could you spot me? You know what I mean? Like, God hasn't lost his money. He hasn't lost his mind. He hasn't lost his marbles. God owns it all. And when you start to understand that, it changes the way you see what he has entrusted to you. And if you believe that God just wants your money, I'm telling you, you will never give enough. And I don't mean like give enough like there's a limit to how much he wants you to give. I just mean you'll never give enough to where you can experience the joy that comes with generosity. One of the greatest joys in life is getting to give to someone else. I never forget when I was, um, I was new in ministry. I was a student pastor at a church and there was a family in our church who owned a house down at the beach. And this was so nice of them. They let us use their house. And I brought my whole family. I mean, it, it was amazing. We had an incredible week. And I'll never forget, we were driving around this neighborhood. And uh, my, my, I was telling my dad, I was, he was sitting in the front seat. We were headed over to the grocery store. And I said, Dad, man, the, these houses are unbelievable. I was like, you, I mean, surely these people are happier because they got one of these houses. You know what I mean? Because I was just thinking, I'd be like, man, how incredible would your life be if you had one of these houses down here? And I'll never forget, my dad goes, you going to tell you who's the happiest person in here? The person that let you use his house. And it's true that the joy that comes with generosity far outpaces the joy that comes with consumption. It just does. It's the way we've been wired. And if you believe that God just wants your money, you'll never give to the point where you get to experience the joy of generosity. You'll never find contentment and happiness will be relegated to just these little moments of consumption. When God, I'm telling you, he doesn't want something from you. He wants something for you. And what he wants for you is he wants for you to experience the thrill of generosity. And it starts with stewardship. 
It starts with understanding the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Anything I have, anything that's in my possession is not mine. It is his. I'm just stewarding his stuff. Because that's what this story is all about, right? I told you, two characters, owner, manager. And in every parable, God's, there's usually somebody who represents God and somebody who represents us. And in this story, obviously, the owner represents God and the manager represents us. What was this manager supposed to do? This manager was supposed to steward what he had from the owner. That's what stewardship is. I I put just a little simple definition on stewardship. Stewardship is using God-given, important, God-given money and resources for God-given goals and objectives. Stewardship is going, the car that I have, the apartment that I have, the KitchenAid mixer that I have, the boat that I have, anything I have, God has entrusted it to me, and I'm supposed to use the God-given stuff that I have for God-given goals and objectives. I shouldn't use it just for my own objective because that's not the way you steward. A steward is recognizing what does the owner care about? What is the owner value? What's important to the owner? And let me handle it in that way because I'm a steward. So jump back in. Jesus, this is one of the great things about this passage in Luke. A lot of times with these parables, Jesus will tell these crazy, sometimes complicated and confusing stories. And then he'll just be like, deuce, I'm out. Like, I'm, that's it. And all the disciples would be sitting there going like, what does that mean? <laughs> But in this case, this one's great because he gives us the commentary on it. He tells us what it means. Here's what he says after he gets done telling the story. This is verse 9. This is the big idea. He gives it to us. I tell you, meaning write it down. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. Use your worldly wealth to gain friends for you. Use worldly wealth to cultivate influence with other people. Use your stuff for influence. This guy this morning after the first service, he came up to me and his wife, they were standing there together. She showed me her notes. And in the notes, she she, she had a basketball goal that was laying down. And she just put on top of it, fix it. She said that was her big takeaway. I was like, you're gonna have to explain that. She's like, in our neighborhood... Our basketball goal is like the center of everything. She said, we've had so much opportunity to talk to kids about Jesus because they come into our neighborhood, they come onto our driveway, and they play basketball. And our basketball goal has been broken. And this morning, I started realizing we need to fix it. We need to, if we need to buy a new one, great. But we need to fix it so that we can use what we have to gain friends, to gain influence with other people. This is the idea of wealth, is that it is not for our consumption. It is a tool that God has given us for his purposes. He says, I tell you, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that, that's a henna clause in Greek, it always points to purpose. He's like, if you wanna know what this is for, so that always tells you. So that when it is gone, you know that, right? Surely this is not news to you. Your wealth is going to be gone. It's temporary. What's that saying? There ain't no U-Haul attached to a hearse. You know what I mean? Somebody said you can't take it with you when you're gone. Yeah, that's exactly right. Your money's leaving, people. Some of you are like, oh, it's leaving quick. With bit, with the, the, these grocery bills these days, it's leaving quick. Some of you looking down the row at all those kids. You're like, oh, yeah, they're helping it leave right? No, I just mean, I, what he's trying is, what Jesus is saying is, your worldly stuff is going to be gone. He uses the, world, the word wealth, but it doesn't just mean money. It means anything you put value in, anything that you have. It's your stuff. It's your health. It's your bank account. It's anything. It's all going to be gone. There are only some things that last. And so he says, when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. This is massive. He's going, use your stuff in this life to affect people in the next life. Use your stuff in this life to affect who gets to experience heaven. Here's the big idea. Certain things last, 
Wealth is not one of them. Certain things last. Your wealth, it's not one of them. So use your temporal wealth for eternal worth. Use your temporal wealth for eternal worth. Can, can we stop for one second? Can you think of the person that introduced you to Jesus? Maybe it was a coworker. Maybe it was somebody you're sitting by. Maybe it was a parent. Maybe it was a grandparent. Maybe it was somebody that prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for you. I bet in a lot of people's case, that person's passed away. I can, I, in our family, we have kind of the matriarch of our family, a, a grandmother named Lucille, who was, um, man, she was a treasure. She was a trip. If you acted up, she would grab you by the ear and she would set you straight. But she was amazing. And I'll never forget, I mean, there are some things that my sisters and I, we laugh about that she would say. She died when she was 99. And uh, we would go over to her house. She lived real near us. And so I was over at her house all the time. And I'd be like, hey, grandmother, can I get one of your Cokes out of the fridge? And she would, she would be, always, this is her line, anytime you ask for anything, she'd go, darling, you can have anything in this house that you want. And she was for real. If you saw a picture up on the wall that you thought was nice, you could take it. She's like, let it go, gone, it's out. Because she knew it's all leaving anyway. But man, she was a prayer warrior. She loved Jesus. And every person in our family has been deeply affected because of her faith, because of the way she used her stuff. She grew up with boys. She had uh, three boys that all played football. And man, they broke some furniture in her house. I mean, stuff was always broken. Like the couch is like up on a couple blocks, you know. And she just knew. She just knew the point of the stuff is to introduce people to Jesus, is to use it in such a way that it affects people's lives. I learned it firsthand. And somebody, when you get to heaven, there's going to be somebody that's already there that you're going to see them and you're going to run up to them and go, thank you, thank you, thank you, because you picked me up and drove me to church, because you used to buy my lunch, because you used to let me come over and talk about Jesus, because you used your stuff in such a way that I get to experience eternity with my Savior because of you. Everybody's got that story. And what Jesus is trying to remind us is that that could be your role in somebody else's story. There might be a young kid someday that comes up to you and says, I don't even know if you remember me, but I used to play basketball in your driveway. And I met Jesus because of your family. He says, hey, this is, um, this is a big deal. Would you be willing to use your Temporal wealth for eternal worth. And then he makes some big statements. Look, we don't have time to get into this, but this is massive. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with very much. He's like, if you want to, some of you are like, I'd like to have more. Some of you want so badly to be wealthy. Some of you want so badly, you feel like, I would like to have a bigger house. I'm not saying this is what he's saying, but I'm just saying it seems like he's saying, show me that you can use what you have now, and I'll know that you'll be able to be trusted with more. That's what he says. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest or misuses the little, they will be dishonest with much. He says, so if you have not been trustworthy with handling worldly wealth, then who will trust you with true riches? If you can't show that you can handle what you got now, how can you expect more? He says, if you have not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you property of your own? Some of you, you're going to misapply this, and you're going to be like, God's talking about home ownership. There it is. Like, I've been wanting to get my own house. I don't know if that's what he's saying. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think what he's trying to say is, would you use your stuff 
so that people will be in eternity. And if you can show that you're willing to do that, isn't it common? Isn't it intuitive? Isn't it logical that any owner would trust the manager with more if the manager is showing that they're able to handle the stuff? Because ultimately he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then he sets up this idea that it's not about just fame. It's not about just power. No, he says the greatest competitor for your heart is wealth. It's money. And if you love it, and you wanna just use it for yourself, and you think that everything you have is because you work hard for it, and it's for your own consumption, you're missing it. And it will be a very small little God that you will be a slave to the rest of your life, and it will never give you what you're looking for. He says there is a one true God that if you will put him on the throne of your heart, it will rearrange how you see your wealth and your wealth will not own you. You'll put, you'll put your wealth to work. Some of you need to employ your wealth because right now your wealth is employing you. He's saying, no, put your, see your wealth as a tool. It's a tool that God has given you to influence people for eternity. Big idea, he says, be a shrewd steward so you can be a generous giver. Be a shrewd steward so you can be a generous giver. I'm going to give you a simple little game plan. This is what I was taught when I was just uh, a college student. I heard somebody teach on this same passage, and they use these three same words. You can write these down. You can memorize these. But this has been the framework that my wife and I have seen finances through for the last 20 years. Number one, would you be willing to give with priority? Put it first. Put giving first. Most people, they put it last, right? Most people live the way they want to live. They save if there's any left over, and then they'll give if there's any left over from that. No, 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 no. Jesus people, we do it the reverse. We give, we save, and then we live. Would you put it in that order? So some of you need to have a meeting. Some of you need to have a meeting with yourself or a meeting with your spouse and figure out, what's our giving plan? What are we doing? Where are we going to give? How much are we going to give? How are we going to give? I just believe that locking it in and giving it first is the way to do it. Number two, would you give with a percentage? This is so much better than just tipping God. But to give with a percentage, a plan. I love that Chad said last week that tithing is, in a way, it's outdated. And in a way, it's, it's too big for some and too small for others. That Jesus didn't just say 10%. Jesus said, no, I want all the percents. I want your whole life. And for some of you, 10% is too low. Some of you, you need to start at 1%, 2%, 3%, because maybe 10% feels too crazy. But I, I believe the idea of it is still true. Pick a percentage, lock it in, and give first. And then number three, would you be willing to give progressively? I love this idea. Would you be willing to give progressively? For one, I think it parallels spiritual growth. You know, giving is all about trend line. It's not about how much. It's about where are you trending? Are you trending towards wealth being your small God? Or are you trending toward wealth becoming a tool that God's given you to use? And progress is about taking a step forward. So would you be willing to do a little more? Next time you get a raise, give a higher percentage. Next time you have some kind of thing that happens where you get some money that comes in that you didn't see it coming in. Some of you are like, yes, Lord, today, in your name, bring it, right? Make it rain. <laughs> well, would you be willing to progressively give? Take a step every time something happens. When the calendar flips, great time to take a step. Would you be willing to take a step and be progressive in your giving? Give with priority, give with percentage, and give with progress. Be a shrewd steward so you can be a generous giver. Here's why, and then we're done. Because Jesus seems like he's trying to say, there is a life after this life. I believe it because he believes it. I believe it because he says it. I believe there's a heaven, and I believe there's a hell. And Jesus says, 
It lasts longer and it matters more than anything that happens in this life. Don't make your wealth a God. No, make your wealth work for you. Imagine your life. Get a vision for your life where you see God allowing you to use your stuff to make a difference in somebody else's life. This is one of those areas of life where you're, at, you're either going to wish you had or you're going to be glad you did. And you're going to get to the end of your life and you're going to look back. And you're going to be able to say, I'm so glad that my stuff didn't own me. I'm so glad that I was able to employ it and use it as a tool so that this person and this person and this family and this mom and this dad and this friend could meet Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will allow us to do that. Give us eyes to see it. Give us a vision for our life today. Help us to see far beyond just our little stuff. Help us to see far beyond what we're holding in our hands. But help us to see a future. God, this is about trend line. We're moving somewhere. Give us courage to talk about this. Give us courage to open up and be vulnerable about this. But God, give us a vision to be able to see the life that could be. I pray for any person today that's thinking, I, I'm a little worried because I feel like wealth is my God. I pray that today that they would get on their knees and they would give you their life. That They would say, Jesus, you are life. True satisfaction, true joy, it comes through you. And we worship you, we honor you, we trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.